In the last video, it was nothing but an introduction, a preface, or if you will, of me just going at it at the camera. <laughs> it's just like, oh, okay. If Calvinism isn't true, your pain and devastation when you were born and how you are and existent right here, right now, is by the will of random chance. Unless God formed you, God knew you, God created you, God made you to be the person that you are today, to challenge the things that you are challenged with. So the thing is, is that is it random chance or is it God? And that's why I have found myself to be more Calvinistic. Never read John Calvin's work, never read um, C.S. Lewis's work. I, I know he's not a Calvinist. I don't care to read other people's work until I am stuck with like, well, what does this have to say? And then when I hear a Calvinist or somebody who's reformed, I need to hear the counter argument to be like, is this correct? Does this fit in with the logic, coherent, and consistent worldview? With A, what is predicated upon scripture? For example, God, I love doing this. I love doing this because it does, it's like, oh, it proves my position. I have not had anybody actually explain this to me who is not a, a non-Calvinist to understand this. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. The Lord God made the serpent crafty. Ah. New Testament, Colossians 1.16. For by him, Jesus Christ, God, all things were created. Were you created? Okay, I, I don't really mean to do this in a way that's very inappropriate or has somebody giggle in the worst way, but I want to explain it like this because what are the implications of this one verse? I apologize if this might be graphic. The sperm that goes into a woman and the eggs that the woman has, God made them. Mm hmm. God made them with a certain vis uh, height, depth, weight, viscosity, <laughs> like with all the characteristics, God made them. God made you in your womb. He made you. Was it random chance? No, God made you in the womb. Did God make you now? Yeah, God made you. The new cells that are in your body today, God made them. Could he not have made them any other way? No, God made them for a very particular purpose, with a very particular function. We, as humans, very limited creatures, know not of what God's future plans are in the next 15 seconds. I can have some guesstimations, I can estimate, I can plan and do some research. We can have some evaluations of what, and then predict what the future may have. But God is the one that knows everything and has predestined it. Else, we'll see. Eh, God, God will figure it out too. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Man, I cannot believe, I cannot fathom being a non-Calvinist. I was that person at one point in my life. And I'm like, wow, all the pain that happened to me. God allowed it to happen to me so that I may glorify him. And my relationship with that fact, I mean, I, I, I am bitter and cuss out at God, but my emotions aren't meaningless. Me arguing with God is not meaningless because he gave them to me. And if he gave them to me, it was for a purpose. And there is no meaninglessness. It's all for him and his glory with the kingdom. He is, has, is his. He's bringing to fruition. Fruition? Yeah. So let's get into this. Uh, they're about to tackle somebody's audio um, that they're about to discuss afterwards. So <laughs> we, we should be. A few things to say. Yeah, we, we should be good. So uh, let's, uh, let's listen in to uh, Keith Thompson as he responds to Kevin Thompson. Here we go. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Keith Thompson. And really quickly, I wanna to respond to uh, Soteriology 101, who basically made a clip or responded to a clip I uploaded yesterday of uh, R.C. Sproul titled, 
R.C. Sproul tired of pussyfooting. And basically the whole segment is them attacking Calvinism uh, as being something that's unbiblical and, and, and not a correct representation of the gospel. And again, I've made these videos over and over and over again, and I will continue to make them to defend not John Calvin, not Calvinism, but doctrine that rightly defends, explains, and presents the gospel completely. Do you hear that? The person who is having the discussion, the person who is saying, hey, Leighton Flowers and Kevin Thompson, Leighton Flowers and Kevin Thompson, it's not about John Calvin. Stop talking about him. It's not about the idolatry of, oh, thank God John Calvin spoke, therefore I can have my belief system. Yay! It's first and foremost, are these doctrines that are being spoken about true? is free will, but that's not a biblical word, shut up about it because we need to focus on scripture, is what is being presented correct. That's it. Leighton Flowers and Kevin Thompson, will you please be respectful, not to yourself, not be peaceful and kindful to other people. Can you please have a lick of sense about you? But the beautiful thing about this, the beautiful thing about this, your knowledge comes from God. Daniel 2, chap, uh, Daniel 2, verse 22. God is the revealer of mysteries. God is. He created all things. Something in which they say, well, God died for all people. It's just plain and simple right then and there. But if I use that exact same statement, oh no, the context is different. Did God make your mind? Did God make the thoughts then in your head? No, those are evil. But nothing happens outside of the will of God. And um, with a sparrow in the tree, I'm trying to remember what that uh, verse is. So let me actually take the time to look it up because it's a vitally important thing to not just say a verse and just go over it. It's actually important to look up the verse, make certain that I'm accurate with what it is that I'm saying. So Bible verse, sparrow. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Matthew 6. Oh, okay. I was thinking some other uh, some other chapter. Matthew sounds correct, but... Oh, 24. Hmm. No, that's not it. If I can, let me pause it. I think that'll be the best thing. It was surprising because I got the right book, but I got the wrong chapter. It's Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And another word from a part of? Without one's will or intervention. Nothing dies without God's control over the matter. How do you explain evil? God first gave it permission. It's not first God, first man sins. God gave permission for it to happen in the first place. And it's like, well, God's responsible for evil. What do you mean? We did it. Well, he knew. In your worldview, evil just happens. And I, okay, here, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. At the very beginning in the introduction, I talked first about presuppositional apologetics. If somebody has such a an hell-bent um, issue with God being the one that's responsible for sin and God is the one that did it all, first and foremost, what does Scripture say? Only through the will of God does anything happen in the first place. Sparrows don't fall from the trees, they don't fall to the ground, they don't die without God's will or intervention. It doesn't happen without first God. Okay, so what are the implications of that? Well, God is responsible for evil then. Um, anything and all... Uh, uh, God made you a sinner. How do you explain that in your worldview? Well, I myself am a sinner. Not from yourself, God made you. He, I think he made you incomplete, so he may demonstrate his mercy upon you. Well, that's evil to do. By whose authority, by whose standard do you judge? 
That's the whole point of us being alive in the first place. Before his demonstrative purposes, not because of ours, we benefit. We get to be glorified through his love and mercy for those who are in him. But what about those who never had a choice? So your presupposition is that there has to be a choice to begin with? God is sovereign over everything. No choice can happen without his permission. You see where it comes from? Like, wh who's the God that you serve? Nothing happens outside of the will of God. Nothing. There is no accident. There is no random. Nothing. And for anybody who speaks back to God, who are you, O oh man? Romans 9. Who are you? Who are you, O oh man, to speak back to God? Will the thing molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? I know there's explanations and it's like, oh, I don't, I, I refuse to accept that, but that's the answer. This guy that they're about to try to try to tackle has nothing to do with John Calvin. It has nothing to do with Calvinism. Calvinism really is the stem of R, is Tulip correct? And I believe Studip, uh, where you're replacing the L with limited atonement with like the D or something like definite atonement, like Again, uh, the, the definition specifically meaning that when God saves, God saves completely, that there is no other means other than his sacrifice that is needed to uh, save, and faith is a gift that he gives to those he has saved. It's, it's, is it correct? That, is that correct? As If that's correct, then what else is correct? And if it's wrong, then we need to not abide by it. So, it, and it's not about John Calvin, it's not about Calvinism, it's about Tulip is a total depravity. Is, is predestination true? I believe it to be true. Well, then therefore, I believe in heresy. Okay. Fine. I am okay with you, of all people, saying that to me. You're wrong. <laughs> like, how can I convince somebody who literally, by their own nature, lies to himself? Well, you're doing the same thing. It could be also applicable to you. Exactly. God is the one that gives truth. To demonstrate, it's him who does the work. Well, you mean the one that does evil? He's the one that gives good. He allows evil, but made evil. He made evil, but allows it to happen. But through his demonstration of giving wrath to those, it's, it's one of those things of like, well, I disagree with that method. That's not justice. I understand. It's by whose authority do you say that it's either right or wrong. God created you for what purpose? So you may have a choice? Is that really why you exist in the first place? What about all the people that never had the choice and never heard the gospel? How do you explain that? In your worldview, that, that, that doesn't exist. And well, God had to have given them a chance. If not, God is wrong. God made everybody for his purpose and his reason. Your relationship with that fact changes what type of God you serve. God of the Bible or God of your own desires. Okay. See, those who are Calvinists, we're not talking about hyper-Calvinism. Okay, we're talking about those who rightly attain to the five points of the tulip. Okay, as being totally biblical. My, my question to anyone who is against Calvinism is, which one of the five points, and no, we're not four-pointers or three-pointers. If you're not a five-pointer, you're not holding to the biblical doctrine, okay? But my question is to anyone who is against Okay, so it seems like to me, at least so far, what we have is someone who is pr pretty staunch in his affirmation of all five points of Calvinism. Yes. Um, and, yes. and I've dealt with others like this that say, if you're not a full five-pointer, you're not a Calvinist at all. Um, even though it's it's debatable whether John Calvin actually held to, to all five points, basically. And, and guess what he does? Guess what Leighton Flower does? Guess what he does? He brings up John Calvin! John Calvin wasn't a five-point Calvinist. I don't care whether or not. I don't care. Albert Einstein was wrong about God. He was brilliant about all the other things about science. But he was wrong about this. Okay, but Albert Einstein provided something beautiful. He, again, do you understand where the, the, 
It's not the anchor point of John Calvin. The guy and me both explained it's not about John Calvin. Don't talk about him. It's, it's, he's irrelevant. He's irrelevant to the five points of Calvinism. Okay? Okay? He's irrelevant to the five points of Calvinism. Is Tulip correct? Is Tulip correct? You say no. I say yes. We both believe that doctrine is the supreme uh, standard in which we are to abide by. How are we having different belief systems, yet we believe the same thing? How do you have a conversation with somebody who literally has a presupposition or axiom that's just different than yours? How do you have that? I don't know. It's very, very interesting. But you go through the logic, coherent, consistent rationalization that somebody has to point out the flaws of their position. Your belief systems are either given by God or they came from you. And you came to God by through you, your own volition, your own will, your own superiority over other people. You lucked out <laughs> or God gifted it to you to demonstrate his purpose and his plans. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We are to think and to grow and to believe and to feel and to have an experience and to rationalize and have debates and be loving towards one another. Why? So we may demonstrate the glory of Christ who works in our lives day by day. I'm a new Christian, but that doesn't justify me in doing bad things. It doesn't justify me in being bitter to somebody. It's God who saves. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. I am gifted faith. From who? God. On some right. of the things yeah, you said yeah. about atonement. Um, mm -hmm. But it does sound like this guy's a real... more of a Calvinist than Calvin was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, they, they talk about how some people like to out Calvin, John Calvin, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, try to be more Calvinistic than John Calvin was. Um, but uh, the, the again, it's about John Calvin, John Calvin, John Calvin. The guy at the very beginning of his audio said, "It's not about John Calvin. Please don't bring him up. It's not. Is Tulip correct?" And then their argumentation is, "Well, John Calvin." <laughs> Point being is that ultimately starts with a, a question begging argument. Obviously, he's not making an argument really no. at all. He's just stating Calvinism is biblical, and everybody should already know that. Um, he doesn't, he, right. of course, make an argument for that. Did he just make an argument that everybody should know that? Did really did the guy on the audio really say, well, everybody should know that it is? No, he didn't. He didn't. Leighton Flowers and Kevin Thompson are already imposing upon the other guy's argumentation. This is why exegesis is so important. Did the guy inhint it? He could I can make a claim that Calvinism is biblical, and if you disagree with it, you're wrong. So what he said, everybody should know it. No, no, no. Not everybody does. Why? Because it's something learned. Oh, you mean that I have to learn something that's outside of the Bible? No, 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 no. How do you know anything about God? You read it in the Bible. You learned it. You read it and became understood by it. So when God says, you cannot come to me unless the Father first draws you, it's God drawing you to him, to Christ. You can't come to him unless that happens. Well... I have a way to explain that around. It's like, okay, your, your way of understanding scripture is much different than mine because I'm just going to go from left to right. Does this make sense? <laughs> okay. Um, and, and we could do the same thing. We could just say, no, you know, ours is biblical. That's how you pick out a question begging argument. If you can just say the exact same thing back to the other person that they just said to you, that's just question begging. It's the lowest form of debate. Yep. It's not really an argument. Yep. It's just... Um, it's just stating uh, that you're right and I I'm right because you're wrong is basically the, the. Right. But they're doing the exact same thing with Calvinists. John Calvin and Calvinism is wrong. Why? Because predestination doesn't exist. God predestined your steps. He predestined everything. He created everything. He created the sperm and the egg that would happen for you. If not, okay, let's think of it like this. Sperm, egg. Sperm, egg, sperm, egg, sperm, egg, boom, new human being. God created that because he created all things, including time. He created every single moment. That happened. That was his creation. Or you want to modify the text of God. I was like, whoa, whoa, uh, yeah. huh? God created all things. There's no meaninglessness. There's no purposelessness. 
your feelings actually matter. They're not you. Evil is evil, because God determined. God declared it evil. Don't do this. That's what makes it evil. <laughs> You're like, don't do this thing. This is a bad thing. God said, do this. This is what's good. God is the one that determined what is good and evil. It's not something that we find within nature because the nature came first. It's God declared the universe to exist in the first place. Therefore, the things that he's declared of what is either right and wrong has been declared in first and stem from him. We know anything because of him. They'll say the same thing. But what are the implications of that? Anything that I know first comes from him. They can say the same thing, but they believe it's God's provision of sal salvation. <laughs> it's... Ugh. Such a nuanced approach of how do you how do you condense it? How do you condense the idea of like you're just wrong because you're saying one plus one equals a banana? That's not correct. But they believe it to be correct, so therefore, how again, one of those things of how do you communicate, how do you rationalize with somebody when their axioms, their presuppositions are wrong? The level <laughs> of the argument. So, um, anything else you want to say on that portion before we go on? Well, he, he mentions the gospel twice. And, you know, somebody recently made a comment, and, and I never heard it put this way before, but this makes a lot of sense. And I don't want to sling labels around, but somebody said that liberals take away from Scripture and cults add to Scripture. They add things, you know, like, you know, the Mormons got Jesus coming from planet Kolob and weird stuff like that. And... When it comes to the gospel, it's it's interesting to think what what exactly are they thinking that is correct about the Calvinist gospel when the scripture is very clear about what the gospel is. You have the the definition of the gospel. For anybody that's having difficulty out there listening to Kevin just because of his internet feed, it's not necessarily the fault of him if um, if there's again some misunderstanding per se. Um, but what he's communicating is that the gospel. Uh, liberals take away from scripture, scripture, cults add to scripture. That's a very valid point. That's very valid. But he's going to be making a point here in just a second where it's like, okay, that's why I am a Calvinist. God saves to the uttermost and never loses a person. And it's not dependent upon me surviving faith all the way to the end of my life. Because if I come to the faith, we'll get into that in a second. The gospel is given in Romans 1.16, and the content of the gospel is given in 1 Corinthians 15.1-4. The definition is that the gospel is the power of God and salvation to those that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then the content of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and he's buried and rose again the third day um, according to the Scripture. Um, so... Uh, it's, it's always curious to me. And, and on the other side, you got Calvinists on one side, then you got the full gospel on the other side. You know, the full gospel. Before we get into what is it, uh, Calvinism and the gospel, he, Kevin, has already divided Calvinism with a subpar gospel. Already divided it. His presupposition is that Calvinism has no gospel. Even though when I explain it this way, God saves to the uttermost. Your relationship with that fact changes whether or not you actually have uh, God's spirit within you. Because when you project onto somebody that they are not saved because God condemns some people to go to hell, you don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows exactly who's going to be the one who is saved or not. There are people in the faith that fall away. Because through their experience, God was just a convenient tool to have a really good life. I never believed in the first place, but he only came to that realization a year ago. But he believed when he first came into the faith and then left 20 years later. Did that person have saving faith at all? Did he lose his salvation? The answer to Kevin would be no. But when he first came to the faith, Kevin would say, yes, you do have salvation. It is yours. It's yours. You know it's yours because you are saved when you believe. And he comes to the faith and he bows and he submits to Christ. And at some point it just got tiring and he walked away. Kevin would have to change his mind about who he thinks is saved and not. 
But he thinks that everybody, everybody's given God's sacrifice, and it's up to you to decide. I, he doesn't use those words, but there's no other way to explain it. God saves by giving everybody the provision of grace. But what does it say in Scripture? Faith is a gift from God. Faith is. You having it is a gift. If you didn't have faith, you don't have the gift. Well, it's up to me to decide whether or not I have the faith. Exactly. Salvation requires you. In your worldview, it requires you something from yourself to do something, to think it, to feel, to have these circumstances being bent and willed towards you. You have to hold on to what I do and to what I think and feel and anything that happens in my mind. God was not in control of it. Something from me had to have happened first. But what does God say? First God, but God, him gave gift and it's up to me of whether or not i choose to accept it or not okay so salvation is required upon you salvation is required upon you salvation is required upon you not god where's the gospel in your worldview that i as a limited creature with limited understanding have a, a bad day reject god because i stubbed my toe because my child died why would God ever allow something like that? Damn be to God because he is wrong? I have a bad experience in life, therefore I curse God and, sin and ask him to go to hell. What type of worldview do you have with the relationship with God? How powerful is your God? Is God sovereign over the situation? Because did he ha give it permission to happen in the first place if the answer is no he wasn't sovereign over it he didn't have control he didn't have the power it's not on god it's up to circumstance and god is trying in kevin's worldview separating calvinists and calvinism from the actual gospel by default eliminates calvinism from being the full gospel the full gospel is that god saves from the, to the uttermost from the beginning to the end from all of eternity you were never not known by god you were forever known by god intimately to speak that to somebody versus your position god didn't know you until yesterday and now that he's here he wants to save you what do you mean they could still fall away from the faith because it's not up to god as whether or not he's saved it's up to the individual creature that is limited in their capacities who is the reliance upon this oh you say christ i do too it's god well that's man-centered ideology because you're following calvinism there's no winning with you kevin you hate people who have the right doctrine of gospel you hate them because it requires nothing from them and because they don't have my ideology therefore they're wrong kevin an independent fundamental baptist a king james onlyist if you will now now if these words i'm not supposed to say to somebody they don't correctly identify what somebody says words are a phenomenal tool to describe what something is and who someone is as well where is your gospel the good news God, but done, we're done. That's the good news. It really is. It first starts with God. God has you from the uttermost. He will never lose you. You having a bad day? Did somebody violate you? Did you lose an arm? Did you have a, did you go bankrupt? Did you have to choose between you, the love of your life over your career and you made the choice of career losing the love of your life and they're gone forever? God was not away from you, per se. 
because God allowed it through his permission to demonstrate the good that comes from that. And it's like, what, what does this do? First, God has, gives it permission because first he declared the end for the beginning. So any and all things are going to happen the way that he has ordained it to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We have limited experience. We have limited understanding. But God, what does God command us to do? Think and learn and grow and evolve to become a better human being, to actually seek out wisdom. And when we don't seek out wisdom, and then we become aware that we weren't seeking out wisdom, and we have to learn how to seek wisdom, then we have that understanding that when we learn this, we give to the next generation the wisdom that we had. Don't do this, do this. This is what's good and this is what's not. Fear God, no one else matters. No one else is to be feared uh, in comparison to the Lord. But again, just fear the Lord. Primarily because nothing, no worry will ever change how much time you have on this earth. Isn't that from Matthew 10? <laughs> but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Uh -huh. I think it's in uh, chapter 6. That you cannot increase or decrease the amount of time that you have on this planet. You cannot say that in, in the non-Calvinistic worldview. Calvinism emphasizes what is in Scripture, predestination. And the good news is that God, it's God, not me. And God has me for a good plan that expands out for all of eternity. And there's nothing I can say or do, think or feel or even having hatred for God for what it is that he does to me. Because when I communicate that to God, by whose authority do I claim that what I say about God is true? Whose authority do I base my entire foundation of hating God? Me or what God said? You have two ways of thinking here. Biochemical, temporary, subjective, reactionary, opinionated person who has a mind of rationalizing what it, they feel and they think is correct because feeling, of, because being understood is wrong, that's a painful thing. Brain doesn't want to do that, so it'll fight against it. Versus the one who never lies. Well, he said he predestined all things. He spoke the end from the beginning. It's already done. You cannot increase your life. You cannot decrease your life from worry. So have peace. Live. Laugh. Love. The good news is God. Because when you're dead, God got you. And there's certainty in that because he already spoke it into existence. It's already done. His world is already complete. We just haven't gone through it yet. <laughs> because once we get there, and all knees shall bow, which again means that this entire world is not meaningless, the entire world will bow down eventually to the sovereignty of God, to him being in rulership and authority, that we are to fear him. Why fear God? Why fear him at all? Because he can cast you one way or the other. He predestined it. But thing is, we should never project onto another person who has been saved or not. Because I can tell you, I didn't think I'd ever be saved. I didn't want to be saved, actually. And it's whether or not I actually wanted to be saved, I hated the idea. I was like, F God, screw him, I hate him. He gave me this, he did this to me, he's stupid. But by whose authority did I say any of that was true? My own bi bi uh, biochemical, temporary, subjective, reactionary, opinionated mind that often lies to itself to justify its own, uh, its own state. Who do I listen to? God. But that really makes more sense in a logical, coherent, consistent fashion with Calvinism. Again, Calvinism is stemmed from, if not primarily focused on, tulip. Is it correct or not? That's it. I am a reluctant Calvinist, but I am nonetheless because I have found it to be true. Predestination is something that, you know what? God either determined it or it's random. 
And boy, howdy, your world must be crazy to think that, oh, yeah, it's random, but God's doing his best. Is he sovereign, though? He's not all sovereign. He's just very sovereign. <laughs> so, even though he gave all authority over to God, it's it, Matthew, uh, again, the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28. It's um, I, God gave all authority to Jesus. The Father gave all authority. All authority, including whether or not somebody's going to come to the faith or not. He has the authority to determine what's going to happen because he spoke it into existence. Because he has already spoken it to be. People, it's it's like there's a... Uh, what I don't, I don't know what it is other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that they think the gospel is that the rest of us are missing. <laughs> yeah. You know? So it's... it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is only half of the equation of the gospel. The other part of the gospel in your worldview is that it requires you to have faith in him. So it's dependent upon you. It's dependent upon you. It's an incomplete gospel. It's not that Jesus Christ was resurrected and therefore that's the good news. What do you mean it's the good news? Whether or not I'm saved is on to me to whether or not I actually care about the thing. And if I do come to the faith, fantastic. But what are the factors? What are the implications of me being the one that's dependent upon whether or not I'm saved? Well, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with you, they will say. Nothing to do with you. But you cannot be saved in your worldview, Leighton Flowers and Kevin Thompson, without you having the faith. You say, oh, it's a gift from God. Yes! From him. Not from you. Gift. From him. Not from you. How clear can somebody make that? And yet you continue to deny it based off your axioms and presuppositions that Calvinism is wrong. It's just wrong, wrong. I mean, they'll say that. They try to align their belief system with the gospel. And as the gospel is very simple, you don't need the Calvinistic system to have the gospel. So um, that, that's always interesting to me how they try to do that. Especially they, they, they. You're doing the exact same thing. Them. Them. Yes, you two are wrong. Because without your involvement, without you doing the thing, you cannot be saved. God did not save all people because there are people that have been born that are apparently due to random circumstance due to random actions that free, that free will creatures are, have an ability to thwart God and change the plans in which he has determined to change whether or not somebody's going to be born. And if that's the case, the people that could have been born that didn't get born, those people would ne never have eternal life. They will never have life to begin with, which means that you lucked out. You won by circumstance. You pulled the roulette wheel and you won. Some other people didn't pull the roulette wheel, but they still lost. So <laughs> your world is stupid. <laughs> I won because me. <laughs> when they say Calvinism is the gospel, well, like I pointed out yesterday, I don't think Calvinism has a gospel, actually, when you think about it. Well, and, we, and we've brought correction even from other Calvinists who have... Uh, who have rebuked Calvinists for saying that Calvinism uniquely is the gospel, especially the tulip systematic it's in and of itself right. uh, is, is the gospel. Um, and that that's something that some, I think people are out Calvining John Calvin again, by yeah. assuming that the. Again, focusing on what John Calvin said or did John Calvin could have said, Oh, there's four points of Calvinism. And another person said, Oh, actually there's a fifth one, but we're still focusing on John Calvinism, Calvinism because he's the one that originated the idea and someone else could have improved it, kind of like Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison didn't quote-unquote create those inventions. He hired other people for the inventions. He gets the credit. The light bulb was not necessarily created by him specifically and ex well, ex specifically exclusively him. Ex exclusively him, it was not created by Thomas Edison. The light bulb had like the filament was created by some other person. Um, I don't even remember who that was. I think it was, uh, I think, oh, there was a controversy behind, uh, I think it was a black, a young, a young black man and uh, with, definitely with glasses. I'm trying to remember what the photo was. I think he had a, a mustache. 
I don't know. But there was a controversy about, oh, the white man to the black man. I, I remember there was some lo- lo- news source or something that came out with it. It was like, oh, racism is within us everywhere. It's like, oh, my gosh. Shut up. <laughs> it's like, okay, he took credit from somebody else's work. Yeah, that never happens with any other specific skin colors. <laughs> no, it's a, it's an issue with man, humans. So, um... Again, Thomas Edison gets the credit. He's not the one that created it per se. He's not the one that fine-tuned it and made it great. The light bulb that I have, the light bulb that I have is LED. It's not an incandescent light bulb. I don't care about uh, Thomas Edison's invention, but it predicated upon his invention. He still had many flaws within him, but he he does get the credit at least for whatever reason, maybe popularization, maybe because he had a large company, but because a lot of people were trying to seek him out when it comes to his, uh, with people wanting to seek him out in the first place. And uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, Nikola Tesla, because of him getting sued by Thomas Edison, Edison because of the wealth, uh, the money that he was, uh, that Thomas Edison was going or had a chance of losing, he tried to squash Nikola Tesla, Nikola, Nikola Tesla, Tesla's um, inventions of free energy for all people. Like it was credit to him of all the things that we have gotten, but there's so many flaws that a person has. But because Thomas Edison did that evil act, therefore never use a light bulb. It's like you see some like the flaws in the, these logics of like, well, because this man is flawed, every single person is flawed. A person who makes a video is flawed. When you come out with the with the video literally stating um, provisionalism, provide, P-R-O-V-I-D-E, and you use an ac- as it as an acronym to say, hey, provisionalism is correct. You yourself are flawed because you're flawed. If I say that I am now a provisionalist because of this video, am I not saying say- Leighton Flowers is the most amazing person in the world? Go, Jesus Christ, and Leighton Flowers. Yay! I am a Leighton Flowerist. I'm a provisionalist because of this man. Not because of gospel, but because of this man. It's like, but wait a second, is it true that people sin? Again, freaking heck yes, of course it is. Um, but like, you're responsible, open door, vicarious atonement, illuminating grace, etc. So, it's one of those things of, just because somebody comes up with an acronym, is the acronym correct? If the acronym's correct, okay. Again, I'm a reluctant Calvinist, but the more that you continue to say Calvinism's wrong, it's like, it's not though. It's not. I don't care about the legalities. Uh, for example, I don't care about soccer. I think um, European, again, the, the, I guess the way that everybody else describes it, football. Um, I don't care about soccer. It's not my sport. It's not my game. But when somebody says it's not a sport, I will defend it. And because I keep defending it, it's like, but it's a sport, though. It is a sport. It is correct. It's a, it is a sport. But somebody says it's not a sport. But it is a sport. Well, it's a stupid sport. Well, that's a different category entirely. (laughs) But when somebody says Calvinism is wrong, okay, well, how is it wrong? If you are either predestined or you are a random accident that God did his best to make, which means that it's not God first, it's man first and what we do with each other. Individual claims of predestination with regard to God choosing certain individuals before the foundation of the world uh, unconditionally electing certain people who are born corpse-like dead and making those people alive. Yes, because you and I don't know who it is that God chooses to save in the first place. We cast our seeds out, and God is the one that grows it. But if God is the one that grows it in your worldview, he's ineffective in growing it inside of a person. He's ineffective because the will of God can thwart man's will which is a very eerie type of philosophy to have while leaving everybody in their else in their corpse like dead condition and judging them for eternity Mm -hmm. for something they have no control over they again what did you just say we're going to end it off with this because i can probably talk about i want to get into this video but we've already had issues i'm having a very difficult time of why talk about this any further why They've already talked about wrong stuff, and they're basing the entire the rest of the conversation off of these wrong stuffs. Um, okay, let's listen to again what Leighton Flowers just said.
because this is the key difference between the gospel and the gospel. Just before the foundation of the world, uh, unconditionally electing certain people who are born corpse-like dead and making those people alive while leaving everybody yeah. in their else in their corpse-like dead condition and judging them for eternity mm -hmm. for something they have no control over. They there we go. That God is the one that chooses to save people, some people, and not others. He, re he makes new, he makes alive, quote-unquote, regenerates them into having a new heart that loves God. And it, through that God's choice first, that process of not choosing other people you can hear from the tonality. Let's let's hear his tone again. Leighton Flowers, the way that he gives an, uh, his response to that fact. Let's listen to it. People who are born corpse-like dead and making those people alive while leaving everybody yeah. in their else in their corpse-like dead condition and judging them for mm -hmm. eternity for something they have no control over. Judging somebody that they had no control over. We exist in a finite amount of time, and God is going to either reward or he is going to do something with you for all of eternity. There is not one person that will not have an eternal state. Eternal hell and damnation, lake of fire, or life and love with Christ. There is an eternity here. Eternity! And this man is saying that the eternity that for me to not have to be ju to be judged for something I had no control over. OK. What about those who were never given the gospel to begin with? How do you explain an eternity for them in hell if they were never given a gospel of faith? The gospel for them to believe in the first place because the word of the God is the power of salvation. Because the How do you explain that? Well, they can choose. How can they choose? They have no knowledge of anything that's different than what their circumstances and their environment is. Well, it's from themselves. We are either God's vessels for his purpose or from ourselves, we determine an eternity based off finite resources that God made entirely. Or God made none of it, even though that's what scripture says. But God did make all of it. Again, I can't, I'm trying to rationalize outside of it, but it's like really hard to do that when it's like I'm basing it off of a lie. God made everything. Did, did God make everything? That also meant your circumstances. That also meant your feelings. That also meant your faith and your faithlessness. Where is your ideology stemmed from? Scripture or man's tradition? Oh, I have no man's tradition. Scripture or man's tradition? Is TULIP correct? Well, let me use it as, let me test scripture and test, uh, again, before TULIP, you always test scripture. Is this correct? Well, again, by whose authority do you say? And it's a very easy way to be like, oh, it's scripture. <laughs> so, again, that's the easiest way to test scripture. By whose authority am I judging scripture? God or myself? Or God, God or anything else other than God? So, start with God's word, okay? Easiest way to test it. Now, let's test TULIP. Well, how do we test TULIP? By the self-attesting word of the true and living God. Did God create all things? Did he speak the world into existence? But from the beginning to the end, he spoke the end from the beginning. Because if that's true, it's already, gonna, it's already done. It's already happened. Whoever's going to come to faith is going to come to faith. But his position is, if they didn't have any control, if they are being judged for some things that are outside of their control, what does Jesus tell us to do? He commands us to come to him like a child. A first century. Middle Eastern child. I was going to say Eastern, but Middle Eastern child. Someone who has no control, someone who has no power, not from yourself. Have no control. Come to me because I have you. 
I have all control come to me. Not one who has any control. So of all the things that I, which I can control and maneuver and think and plan and actually, again, having the control and ability to lift up this phone, having the ability to open up this bottle of water because I'm thirsty and I, and I need to respond in an appropriate manner of actually hydrating myself and making certain my throat doesn't get chapped, quote unquote, or get dry. Again, the, what I am able to control at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, it's God. At the end of the day, it's always God. Throughout the day, I know not, and God commands me to go act. But at the end of the day, I got you. At the end of the day, I don't need you, but I command you. I don't need this person to do it the way that he does. I don't, God says. <laughs> it's like, well, he never said that specifically. And the word Trinity is never in the Bible. Okay, so shush. God need not man. And if you think that he does in any capacity, well, I don't believe that he needs a man in any capacity, but you're only saved through you being the process of the formula. Salvation, a, a sacrifice from Christ, plus me coming to the faith. That is how I am saved. Because it requires me to be the process of saving. But God says it different. I lay the, my life down for the sheep. In verse 29, the sheep that were the fathers, always his, given to who? Jesus Christ. Now, and this is in John 10. John 10, verse 29. I'm going to go ahead and read it because it's just so important. This is such a great thing to be the last thing to mention, and I'm done. Like, my gosh, are you... It is so frustrating to listen to somebody be like, you're just wrong. You are not correctly identifying what it is that I believe in. You're not correctly identifying what it is that I believe in. God or chance, how did you come to be? Well, the influence of God and the influence of man, the man is only able to act because of the permission given by God. So God. Who comes first, chicken or the egg? Which is one that begets the other? God or man. God or chance. Okay. We're going to go to John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. So who does he die for? The sheep. Let's go to verse 29. Oh no, I'm proof texting because I'm skipping so many verses. Verse 29. My father, Jesus says, who has given past tense them, the sheep, to me, Jesus Christ. The, my father is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the Father are one, verse 30. But let's reread verse 29 with some context here. My Father, who has given past tense the, them, the sheep, to me, to understand who the sheep are, the sheep forever ago, for all time past, before time began, all of it, the sheep Jesus dies for, were forever gods. God had a sheep in which he died for. I don't know how else you read this without saying, no, that's wrong, and just rejecting it, which means that you're not truthful. You are a false teacher. You are lying to other people. Please stop. Please repent. It is devastating to see that you are actually leading people astray. It specifically says, My Father, who has given past hints, them, the sheep, to me, Jesus Christ. What are the implications of that? The sheep who will believe. They were always gods to begin with. So what does that mean? What are the implications of the sheep that have yet to be born, 
Which again, that's why I believe that John 3.16 is referring to the entire world. Yes, the sheep that have yet to be born. All of the world, past, present, and future, the sheep that he dies for, were always his. So anybody who comes to the faith, how can you have certainty if it's not because Jesus dies for the sheep but dies for everybody? Because when Jesus dies for that person, is it dependent on any iota from themselves? You say no, Kevin Thompson and Leighton Flowers. You say no. But what is your belief system that you confess and, prof and uh, you are trying to convince other people with? Faith from you, from within me. I came to you, God. I've chosen you. But you can only choose him because he's known you forever. Because of him. Not me. Calvinism has everything to do with humbling yourself with the power that God has. And just saying, I owe nothing, I have nothing, except that which God has given me permission to have in the first place. Which is such both a bittersweet moment. I wish my life and childhood was so much better. I wish I had the type of love. There's a man at this church that I go to, and he has a phenomenal wife, a phenomenal relationship with that wife. There's a woman that I try to ask out and realized, oh, my friend that I have is dating her. And I didn't know that for six months because they kept it secret and tried to hide it from other people. And I was busy at work and couldn't hang out with them and my other friends because I was busy at work. Was that because of a consequence of accident? Or did God have something prepared for that to come to something else? That there's a reason every act happens towards himself. Your worldview is built upon lies, sir. And I ask that you repent. I ask that you do. Because I, oh, I command you to. I plead that you do. Please stop lying to people. Please stop. It is annoying to see somebody harm others by limiting who God is by God's own word. Did he create all things? All of it. What are the implications? Faithfulness and faithlessness free not predates, stems from God first. Because it is given to you, you are given up by God. You, are com you come to God, from God, by God. It all points back to Christ. It all points back to God. I'll say it again. My Father, who has given, has hence them, the sheep, who are the sheep? The ones who hear me and follow me. That God has a sheep from all of eternity past gives those sheep to the Son. And for all of eternity, Jesus intercedes for those sheep. Your relationship with whether or not you want to be that sheep or not is a great testament of whether or not the Holy Spirit is within you. That you don't have any reliance upon yourself of having any good faith. You can watch porn for years and realize, oh, why am I doing this? You can go out and be angry towards your neighbor and just cuss them out on a daily basis. Who's the one that saves you? You can go out and do what it is that you will and you're so I'm just it's like, what else is there? Lust and anger. <laughs> Murder and lust. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> you can steal from somebody every day from your job. You can steal money from them because it's so easy and convenient and you need the money for yourself. You can do these things. Who's the one that saved you? Because Jesus died for you, but whether or not I of myself choose him. 
My comfort and rest does not lay upon whether or not any single day of my life am I doing the right thing. God has died for me. And how can I say that with certainty? Because it's not from me. Faith is first and foremost a gift from God, and I am only allowed to have faith because he permits it to have it have happened. And he can take my faith away because I am his to do as he wills. If you think that is not the case, why do you exist in the first place? Random chance? God made all things. Why do you exist? If you are not in Christ, why do you exist? Well, because of random chance. Because I believe myself in what I do. No, 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 no. That's you right here, right now, what you're telling yourself as to why you believe. Why did you exist in the first place? That Calvinism is everything to be humble with the power of God over your life and to say, humble yourself, come to Christ, and have no power of yourself. It's not from you, it's from God. And faith comes from God, not from you. So everything that I know about Christ was given. Everything in which I feel about Christ was given. And if I am leading anybody astray, and I do something wrong with the person, and I am to be judged, what does God say? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I wish that I would never lead somebody astray. I wish that I would ever not sin and make somebody sin themselves. I wish that of myself and I wish that upon other people that that, that wouldn't happen. But what God has in store for me is for my good for those who love Christ. Including me harming somebody that I don't want to harm. That I leave despot and I don't, for example, a homeless, uh, where I live, homelessness is a major issue. Homelessness is a major issue. If I choose to not give somebody money because I feel bad, because I just, I don't want, I think they're, I think lowly of them. Am I right for thinking that? No. But God has a reason for that to happen in the first place because I'm not in this world by myself. We live in a world of cause and effect and it's leading towards something leading towards someone. Where's the good news in your worldview? You exist in the first place. Why? In Calvinism, you profess the sovereignty of God having control of all things, and you ask, you, by George, demand other people to submit. You need to. God is in control. And those who respond are his sheep. And sometimes, again, we, we again, it's not a direct cause and effect relationship of what we would like. Book of Proverbs, Book of Ecclesiastes, and the Book of uh, Job. It takes some people 10, 50 times to come to the uh, to hear the gospel before they submit to God. Why? Because it wasn't their time yet to be called. Because God has you. He has you, it just may not be the time that you want. Isn't that comforting? But in your worldview, if you don't accept it the first time, you have a chance of going to hell. But there's no chance in God's world, because he has already determined what will be. And all that he asks and commands of you to do is to submit to him. That's it. Nothing. But again, where does that choice come from? It's a gift from him. What glorious news that is. What glorious news that is. Like, there's no gospel in that. What do you mean? Good news that you will be in God forever, because God forever has known you. In your worldview, Leighton Flowers and Kevin Thompson, Calvinism is wrong because stupid Calvinism. How do you explain somebody? How do you have a conversation with somebody who their presupposition is your belief system is just wrong, and they themselves believe falsehoods about your belief? Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing. Like, I don't, I really, I'm, so it's a question I've been trying to a answer, ask myself. It's the only thing that you really can do. Have love and peace. Speak the truth. Pr preach the gospel. Preach and teach the gospel. That's the best that you could possibly do with people who just are so closed off. 
Because if you just don't understand what my belief system is or your position, if you don't have an understanding and you come to the wrong faith in Christ, well, you just got unlucky. And you're not governed by God. You're governed by what you think and feel because those are your choices. Those are your choices. But the right choices that have been made have been made by God. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that I've also been made by him, a sinner. I'm the one that sins and God intervenes to show his mercy. He creates vessels of wrath for, uh, and destruction for his demonstration, allows them to be played with, allows them to be let loose. And when he chooses to, by his own discretion, involves himself in the world to save himself a people of wrath people of destruction, of people of sin. He created us incomplete so that he may complete us. And your issue with that of whether or not you had any choice to begin with, why would I ever want to have any choice in the matter of fact? I have this burning issue that if I don't have any control over my life, but I only exist because I have no control over my life. It's literally because I exist at all because of him, 100%. I exist for the first, I exist because of him. I cannot die until he allows it. There is a radically different position that you have, and it is so infuriating when I receive, when I get something that I don't want. And I, I ask that I could have a, a, let's just be honest here. I ask God every day for a woman that I could just have trust and faith and complete admiration for without idolizing her but the more that i keep saying god i need a wife i got I, I need a wife god i need a wife i be doing this so i can come to the realization that it's not men and women to focus on it's me too first and foremost i give and i take i frustrate the plans of man i hate it i have anger towards him but by whose authority do I come and plead to him and say that he's wrong about any choice in which he makes? I am his to do with as he wills, and I ask to be of glory for him. Where's your good news? God or you? These two will say God, but without their involvement in the salvation process of having faith to begin with. It's not entirely on God. When you understand I have nothing to offer to God, I can really admit that I have nothing, including my faith, because I only have it because of God. It's humbling. Calvinism is all about being humbled by the majesty, by the magistrate, the sovereignty of God. God is all powerful and all authority. And it, it burdens me so, because it's so inconvenient. But God said he frustrates the will of man, the plans of man, of what I want, he frustrates them. He does he, his will. He toys with us as he toys. Oh, he doesn't toy because he's love. Okay, the flood. <laughs> like, go, oh, explain that one to me, sir. <laughs> oh, well, he just killed everything. Pretty much. <laughs> hilarious. Anyways, it's, I want to get through some of these videos. I want to, at one point in my day, get through some of these videos all the way through and to actually explain it. I really want to, but I feel so inhibited by their, I don't want to say idiocy. I will say presupposition. Their axiom that Calvinism is just wrong. Well, it's wrong because it's not biblical. I say my position's biblical. They say their position's biblical. We read the same scripture, and yet we have an entirely different answer and ex uh, explanation for what it says. The difference between how we interpret scripture is predicated upon our own belief systems, our own presupposition, what we believe to be true. If you think through your ability to have faith from you, well, no, it's from God. What are the implications of God giving you faith? He gifted other people not faith. Not for you. I gave no gift to you. Again, think that through for a bit. 
where does logic coherent consistent thought that's how i came to the faith and it's a blessing it took years but not by my own will and volition did i discover and uncover the truth god gifted it to me and it's so frustrating at times and so inconvenient and i'm so tired at times in which it happens because it's like i don't want to have this happen at a certain time but that's irrelevant because god pretty much so thank you for being a part of this thank you for listening thank you for entertaining these ideas i hope and pray that you come to the faith and to be humbled that god has you has you you're not alone you never were alone think about that for a second you never existed how could i have been with god you were intimately known by god before the form of who you were in this world ever happened and for all of eternity is there with you and you're never lost and you're never alone and he's got you and no tears shall shed because god loves you to gift you the life that you've lived so you may be a gift for others and glorify god ultimately that's the good news but god him he died for your sins and i can say that because those who respond may not now but at some point i plant the seeds who's the one that's growing it god and just ask god i need help a difficult thing it really is yeah because i don't know who's going to come to the faith but i ask that you do because your life will change with an eternal bliss and peace it may not be happy but it's just like a and it's just all that issue all those issues just fade they, they don't stop being an issue but they just oh god's got me maybe at times that are inconvenient but boy does he have me <laughs> enjoy your day